welcome very much, uh, Nola, to um, our uh, webinar today. Thank you for um, join, joining us. Um, the Segra community is um, over 8,000 people around Australia and uh, who have a passion and a commitment to regional, rural and remote issues. And we really appreciate um, your, you as Assistant Minister for Regional Development uh, coming on board uh, today to talk about some of the key uh, federal government initiatives for regional Australia. Welcome to our participants today. It's lovely to have you here. My name is Kate Charters and I'm the Chair of the National Steering Committee for Sustainable Economic Growth for Regional Australia, or SEGRA for short. Um, SEGRA has been operating for 24 years and um, it brings together people from uh, business, uh, academics, uh, regional economic development practitioners, government, private business and not-for-profit sector to look at the key issues that are uh, facing regional, rural and remote Australia and looking at the very practical things uh, that we can do in place uh, to address these to address these issues. So it's um, very uh, action focused and um, uh, self-directed. So empowering regions to take responsibility for their own issues um, and to move forward. Um, SEGRA is really committed to identifying the knowledge techniques and skills regions require to achieve a successful economic growth and development. And of course, that's um, in an environmental, economic and community uh, context, our communities in regional Australia um, are very important. So um, today I'm delighted to welcome the Honourable Nola Marino, MP, Assistant Minister for Regional Development and Territories to our 30th SEGRA webinar this Wednesday. Assistant Minister Marino is well known and widely respected as a champion of regional Australia. This commitment was recognised with NOLA being made the ABC Regional Rural Woman of the Year in 1996, so a long, long-standing commitment uh, to regional Australia. NOLA has held various positions on numerous community, regional and agricultural organisations and bodies, such as being the Director and Vice Chair of Dairy Western Australia. The Honourable Nola Marino was also a keen member of the House of Representatives Select Committee on Regional Development and Decentralisation. Um, and it was there that I first met Nola um, and uh, was uh, taken by her passion for regional Australia, but also her understanding um, of the issues that are faced by people who live, work and invest in regional Australia. So uh, welcome Nola, it's uh, lovely to have you here. And uh, very topical, um, Nola will be speaking about the Australian Government's key 2021 budget initiatives um, that support people living and working in regional Australia. Uh, welcome, Nola, and I'll hand over to you at this point. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, um, for that welcome. And how many people do we have on our call today? Sorry? Um, Nearly 100. Nearly a hundred. Yeah, so, it's a great number. Really, um, wherever you are, you can see by what's behind me, that's actually my amazing Bustleton jetty, the longest jetty in the Southern Hemisphere in my part of the world. But I'm here in Canberra today in Parliament House. So wherever you are, um, a big welcome. And uh, thank you for being involved in the web webinar today and, and supporting Segra and the work that you do. I mean, those of us who live and work, raise families and want to retire and and invest in regional um, Australia, really understand how critical the regions are to Australia. And, and it's never more obvious than I think during the global financial crisis and even now, when each of you well understands that it's the wealth and the work that's done in the regions that's helping to keep, us, uh, keep Australia uh, able to do what it needs to do, particularly in its terms of trade and the trade balance around mining and resources, but also in the ag sector. So there's been a huge amount of work and, and as a, a dairy farmer myself, I'm inordinately proud of the fact that even with COVID, that in spite of some logistics challenges, no one in Australia has gone hungry. And that's during COVID and during huge challenges as well as, as historically. 
So uh, unless you're in a difficult personal situation, there wasn't a lack of food. So, um, you know, to have a webinar right now, um, it's a really good achievement. We've all faced such huge challenges with COVID. And for those who are coming out of Victoria, I'm pleased that you're starting to see some movement in that space. And thank you for doing all of the right things to keep yourselves and your community and families safe. You know, the government has really depended on everybody doing their own bit. Um, and as you know, the regional economies have certainly underpinned the nations and it's never been more obvious than uh, now. And uh, that's, just, that's just what we know. So um, the budget handed down, I think many of you will have already seen much of what's happening in the budget around regional Australia. And uh, you've seen the record $110 billion spend in that space and ongoing. So for the regions around infrastructure, transport, digital connectivity, water security, um, regional partnerships with states, they're all designed to make uh, part of, you know, every part of our country better, but the region specifically from our point of view. So it builds on, the budget builds on a number of measures um, and probably responds in a particularly unique way, um, impacted by the events of 2020. You've seen that real focus on jobs um, and we need to make sure that regional Australia has the support it needs to recover and, and grow from the pandemic, but also we know it's a key driver of prosperity beyond this and also our ability to get back on our feet quickly. Much of that drive comes out of the regions. Um, and of course, there are a number of regional businesses that have been able to get on with business because they weren't affected in the same way through COVID as, as um, others were. So, you know, there were a number of budget measures just to ensure the regions, you know, continue to have strong population growth. Um, I've been doing hookups with my regional development Australia groups constantly through COVID and we're seeing people you know, seeing a real re renewed interest in decentralisation and regionalisation. Um, we'll see how that, how that actually rolls out. Research will tell us how far that goes over time and whether they are, the, the purchases that are currently being made are either people investing, people looking at an opportunity, people wanting to have a, perhaps a, a, somewhere to go to should COVID or anything like it happen, or whether they're permanently planning a move to the regions time will tell which of those it is, or it could, I suspect it's a combination of all of the above. So, you know, we want to help um, communities to adapt um, to the new circumstances they're in to keep building that resilience that the regions are so good at, because in the communities that I live in, um, it's the community helping itself and whatever, whether it's local, state or federal government investment and support or seed funding or private investment, the region needs to own it and make sure they continue to make it work beyond the extent of that funding envelope. And if that's the case in that region, then enough people believe in it to make it happen and keep it happening. And that's the key for, for much of what happens in the region. So more and more Australians are seeing um, regional Australia, this whole working from home during COVID and the whole view of regional Australia. I think COVID has, is now seen in a way that perhaps it hasn't been seen in the same light for so long. Those of us who live and work here know it, but perhaps people who live in, in urban centres and cities haven't, haven't really seen it as such an, a, an attractive place to live, to work, to invest, to raise a family, to retire, as what we have until now. So that, I think, presents additional opportunities ahead, um, better lifestyle, less traffic, um, you know, they've got big backyards often, and there are opportunities for well-paying jobs and affordable living that go with the region. So there's a number of incentive, uh, you know, measures in the budget to support and encourage that. And, and uh, you know, I've had a, uh, or got a focus as well on local procurement, and I think this is really important as well. So there's, and that we've announced um, some of the key, I'll touch on the key regional measures um, there was 100 million to fund regional recovery partnerships um, to coordinate investments with other levels of government. And that's to support the recovery and growth in the 10 regions across Australia, in the Snowy Mountains, Hunter and Newcastle, the Parks region, uh, New South Wales, in Queensland, Cairns and tropical North Queensland, 
Gladstone and Mackay Isaac with Sunday Regions, Tassie, um, Gippsland in Victoria, Kangaroo Island and southwest of WA, so that's South Australia and WA as well. So in addition, there's $200 million for the round five of the Building Better Regions Fund, um, 100 million of which will be dedicated to tourism related infrastructure. Really, this is in acknowledgement of the really significant impact that COVID has had on this sector. And that's part of the, the building, what will be part of the Building Better Regions Fund this round. We've also extended round one of the Regional Connectivity Program with an additional $30.3 million. The total investment there's 83 million. So that's to expand the number of eligible projects. Um, so a broader range of regional communities that, and businesses can leverage the benefits of, of improved digital connectivity and find you know, local based solutions um, in areas like agriculture, um, tourism, health, education, really across the board there. And uh, local leaders certainly have uh, a significant role to play in boosting the resilience and vibrancies of communities. And we've got a $5 million building resilient regional leaders initiative as well. And I think that fits very well into your space. There's also 13.7 million to improve the data and program management um, associated with regional policies and uh, continuing investment in Regional um, Australia Institute, you see the work they do, and, uh, and funding also for research and development programs under the Regional Decentralisation Agenda. This is a really key focus of government, the decentralisation and regionalisation. So, you know, they're all key parts of what we're doing. So building better regions, recovery, re R&D, regional connectivity, stronger communities, there's more money for stronger communities, that's the small grants. And as you all know, um, where you've got small communities, you know, grants of between two and a half and, and 20,000 across the country to local community organisations and local governments for small capital projects, besides the significant dollars we've actually put into, um, into um, uh, small councils um, is really um, helping a lot and, and providing a lot of impetus in the community. So there's a lot happening there, um, as well as you look across every portfolio, basically, um, there's a lot happening. And of course, that's all on the back of $257 billion that's already been directly spent in supporting um, a number of initiatives through COVID, much of that in regional Australia. And you've seen the impact of, of that uh, and you know we've got we've had to do a lot of work in that space, um, and they've been driven initially by the health needs up front, and secondly then the economic needs. So they've been really key decisions that we've had to make, and we've also invested again in the regional development Australia networks, and uh, they are critical. There's 52 of those around Australia. They provided critical feedback to me directly during COVID and some of the decisions that government has made and the stimulus measures that have come out of that um, are because of the regional intelligence bulletins that we developed that went to each ministerial, ministerial relevant portfolio that they covered. So we've had from the regions direct impact into the decisions of government and that, that's been invaluable during the COVID and post the COVID uh, issue as well and into the budget. So um, I think I might stop there. I understand there's, um, there's a whole range of other um, projects and programs, but they're the key ones um, that I think you might, um, you know, want to hear about. There's, there's been a billion dollars spent in a re re um, relief and recovery fund, and that was everything from, you know, aviation, the key things for regions and trying to get, um, food and fodder out. All of that um, is part of what we've done um, in this space, but it's, it's a very long list in that COVID recovery space as well as the budget space. So um, I'll leave my comments just in an umbrella sense there. And uh, I understand there's some, some questions that um, may need to or want to be asked. 
Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nola. And I'd like to welcome Robert Prestepino, the principal from Vital Places, uh, who's got a long background of working in uh, place-based regional development programs and design thinking. Uh, firstly, can I thank you for the time you have spent listening to the RDAs. Um, that's been really valuable um, for us to feel that we've been able to communicate um, our issues uh, to government, and, and so we've really appreciated the efforts that um, you have you have put put into that. Um, so thank you for that. And certainly, we've had a number of RDAs talking about their initiatives on our, we our webinar series, and and they're always really popular. There's probably a couple of things that that I'd like to kick off with, and then um, I'll, I'll turn to some of the Q and A's that we have. Um, as people are aware, it's not possible for people to actually physically ask a question in this setup with um, nearly 100 people registered. Uh, but if you use the chat box and the Q&A box, uh, we'll have a chance to read those and um, try and fit as many of those in um, as possible. So one of the first questions I suppose I'm interested in hearing uh, your, your viewpoints about is that there's been a lot of discussion over the last 10 years in terms of place-based driven um, regional economic development and that includes social and community development um, as well. And um, you've picked up already on the importance of leadership um, in that. I actually think, and, and, and I've written on this in terms of innovation, I think regional Australia does innovation and leadership slightly differently from capital cities. <clears throat> I think regional Australia um, have real expertise in connect, connections and networking, um, knowing who's who in the zoo and, uh, and using their own communities well. But can you just talk to us a little bit about the relationships between the three levels of government um, and uh, regional economic development in terms of um, decentralisation, uh, place-based development, the role of local government and leaders at, at the community on the ground level? Look, one of the things that I've... Um um, encouraged from day one the Regional Development Australia committees to do is to try to work or to as much as is possible work with all levels of government and that in my view is how we will achieve the best for not just local regional communities but for state and federal outcomes more broadly but that requires you know um, people to work together in, and that is easier in some areas than in others, and you would understand the reason why. So, um, you know, the federal government works um, uh, quite closely. You've seen the programs that are directly funding local government, but also through the contact that we have through our local MPs, as well as organisations like RDA, um, with local government, it's a very direct relationship. and members of parliament are constantly in contact with their local governments. That's how it works. And they hear from them on a regular basis and usually it's a first name basis. So there's a very direct connection to local government and through to the state level, there's genuinely, you know, the federal government agencies work closely together with their state counterparts. And that is an ongoing process as well. So that works well. And the RDAs, I've, I encourage them to align as closely as they can in any of the regional recovery planning ahead and in strategic planning, that they try to bring together as much as is possible all levels of government and including private enterprise on what clear regional priorities are for that region. And you know there are always those with different views, but where you can align those as much as possible and then whatever um, private or government funding sources are there to work to try to achieve what the community and broader strategic plan have identified as being the key catalytic um, enablers, um, especially with what we're currently facing. Um, and I'm particularly focused on local procurement as a major driver in regional areas. And this has been a focus of mine for many years. But it certainly is as part of um, much of what needs to happen and is happening currently in rural, regional and remote Australia. 
So we've got a whole lot of really amazing businesses that invest in our regions, employ local people. They buy generally as much as they can locally, but they also support our emergency services volunteers, our sporting and service clubs. They're always the ones that you knock on the door and say, I need a donation for X and Y. And having been involved in all sorts of local community groups, local small business is often that person as well. So that's why, the, um, that's why local procurement, that's why small business, that's why um, that's a real focus for me. Yes, look, thank you for that, um, Nola. And I guess um, one of the things which you've just uh, just highlighted, but which has um, come increasingly to our attention in the last probably um, five years, is the um, the capacity for government um, to work collaboratively with uh, business in terms of um, arm's length and and conflicts of conflicts of interest. I've seen some programs coming up in terms of local procurement, uh, but have you got some thoughts about how um, you can bal balance um, developers' uh, interests in, in developing in a region and the region's needs? Look, sort of in this, a is, this, is, this, is, this is not in my portfolio space, so those... Um, that, that really is a comment probably more for Treasury and Josh Frydenberg, but um, we certainly have requirements um, around um, probity matters. So we're very, you know, you're very aware of that, but just the same, um, we certainly, what, what um, Ben Morton has been doing as a minister was seeking to, where there were impediments through regulation, to investment, because that's what we need. We need private investment as well as government investment. And so that deregulation agenda from the government end is very important to enable private investment to occur where it's you know, appropriate and where it's gone through the appropriate approvals processes at local, state or federal level as necessary. So there's a lot of work going on there to into, at a government level, into the barriers for investment. Um, and they vary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific. Look, thanks very, uh, thanks very much for that that reflection, uh, Robert. You like yes, I, yeah, Nola. I was just wondering um, your thoughts on the fact that you know COVID is such an unusual challenge, and we're moving into recovery sort of phase. With these sort of new outcomes, to build back better, have you any thoughts on? The things we'll need or probably should do differently because um, pre-COVID doesn't exist anymore and we're moving into this new different economy. Um, for these new outcomes, uh, what are your thoughts on the things that maybe we'll need to do differently this time around? Um, look, thank you for that. Um, I think the world's changed already. And I think individuals and businesses, my communities have changed what they're doing. And I tell you one of the wonderful things that came out of COVID, was the amount of kindness shown to each other. You know, that's a, and I know that's probably not necessarily a, a reflection, but it actually is that people valued more their time with each other, their time with their family and their friends. And they actually then, there were the acts of kindness in supporting each other were really important. I hope that lasts. But also what we've seen in the business space is more people working from home and finding that there were a lot of useless meetings that didn't need to happen at least face to face, and that there were things they could do differently and would ahead, because um, there's a much greater focus now on small business as well as large business having a very significant online presence. And it's amazing how many small businesses now have changed their work environment, and whether that, how that evolves into the future will depend on their market and the demand for their services or goods. But there are businesses already that have got they're doing just as much business, but it's online. Mm -hmm. They're changing their work hours, the conditions for their workers. There's all sorts of change happening in that space. So in a sense, I think it's brought forward by possibly five or 10 years, the progression that we were already on. But COVID has brought that far more into prominence than it would have been otherwise. And people are very creative. I've got enormous confidence in the innovative 
capacity of Australians, it's particularly young Australians coming through, um, they are always looking at what problem they need to solve and they just get on with it. And so I think the work that Karen Andrews is doing about in that innovation space and manufacturing, we will probably see more Australian manufacturing. What we need out of that is for Australian business and industry to be supporting that. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and then the consumer themselves, will they make, and the question I have for you is, do you think the consumer will ongoing make the decision to buy Australian? And even if it is more expensive, um, because we, we, we do know we need greater self-sufficiency and that's what Minister Andrews is focusing on. But the question comes back to, does the market support that domestically? And that's one of the instances. Um, it's something I know very directly as a Western Australian dairy farmer and who does or doesn't buy a locally grown or produced product. But I think we're seeing more of those local, um, uh, almost not a, not a cooperative, but local people getting together. There's more and more local produce being supported by consumers. Um, the provenance of where you're, whatever it is you're buying comes from matters more than it used to. And I think people are thinking about um, a whole lot of things they consume, use, or their services differently um, as well. So I think, I think that's. I think the market will determine that, but we're at the early stages of it. Mm. Oh, yeah, I, I think you're right. There's an there's an opportunity there, a shift that we could capture and, and enable, and probably along that line too. That's sort of a bit of a segue into some of the conversations about uh, moving into um, catalyst projects. That looking at the shovel ready projects that were designed pre-COVID. Is there a danger they're not going to leverage some of these opportunities you're talking about now that only have existed out of COVID that we might be focusing on the wrong projects? So which projects are you referring to? Well, really, any project that was designed as a solution before COVID hit us, which really was all the, all the shovel-ready projects sitting on the shelves, were thought about in a world before COVID existed. Uh, is there a danger if we race into those, they may not be on the mark because of these opportunities you're talking about now? I think on a, that'll depend on, a, um, to me, the, shovel, the focus of the budget right now and us is around jobs, okay? That's the priority right now with the numbers of people. So shovel ready matters. And so if you, you know, for those, you live and work in regional Australia, you know that if there's a project happening in your region, the amount of local businesses and local people that get a benefit out of that is quite, is huge. So we really need to rebuild Australia, local job by local job, local contractor, local subby, local business back up, up the chain in my view. So that focus on, 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 uh, on shovel ready projects is to make sure that people who had a job could stay in work and those people that needed a job could potentially get a job and that's why the money's also gone into supporting new employment as well as apprentices and others. So right at the moment, um, I think the health, in the health space, the investment that we've made in health has worked as well as we could have hoped it to work. There's been really good work done there and good work done by Australian manufacturers as well in that space. Um, I think at this phase, um, you know, the new business as usual now is uncertainty. Mm. That's, that is the fact of life right now. Business as usual is uncertainty, that we're not sure. But if we've got good planning, if we've got good tracing, if we've got good um, systems in place, if it's our business that ends up with a COVID case, how we do the deep clean, what process have we've got to look after ourselves, our staff and our customers, and how we get out of this quickly and manage any outbreak, keeps us in business, um, that, that's what we really, this is sort of a phase while, you know, everything else that's happening, I think on the ground, when I talk to businesses um, that I do, that's the response I get. They're working on what the conditions are today, how I make the most of that in my business, and then I'm not sure what's going to happen tomorrow, but I'm doing everything I can to give myself the best chance. Mm. 
Nola, uh, we, thanks, thanks for that. We've got um, a couple of things that I'd like to go back to um, and then move forward again. Um, uh, we've had a comment from one of our attendees, Peter, saying that he thinks people will pay a premium if they're confident the premium stays in Australia and goes back to the producer. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, um, RDA, Darling Downs South West and Mary Reid will be talking about the Go Local First project um, and I think that that's uh, um, something you might like to talk about and uh, then Robert ha was telling me uh, because uh, Robert and I both live in southeast Queensland um, we tend to know what's happening in the Darling Downs a bit more but uh, Robert yesterday was um, telling me about a, a, a go local initiative in um, Toowoomba that seems to be uh, going really well. Do you want to just touch on that Robert? Oh, it's just early days it's again um responding to how to help the businesses capture this shift, the uh, custom interest in local and supporting local. Um, it's a bit like Nola said, that a lot of the businesses are sort of scrambling to catch up and to digitise. And um, we want to try and raise all the boats simultaneously rather than just the smart 20% of businesses surviving. We're, we're hoping to try and encourage more, but it's sort of a bit of work in progress. I think we'll have more to report um, down the track a bit, but it's, just another one of those initiatives, people trying to get things off the ground. That's great. Yeah, I think I think a lot of things um, have happened as a result of COVID in in this space, and uh, I'm cer certainly looking forward to it. I, d I just also want to return to um, your conversation about uh, collaboration, and um, I think there have been some really um, successful uh, success stories in the tertiary education sector um, of funding for by uh, uh, pooled funding uh, to get a more tertiary education um, out in the regions, particularly thinking of the uni hub that's gone up in mm. um, uh, Port Piri, but I'm sure there are others um, there are. that would, yeah, would know about. So I just wondered if I, I could throw to you to talk a little bit about where you see, the, um, you've talked about apprenticeships as well. I'm, we're really interested in that and have got some interesting stories about how regional Australia, councils in regional Australia are driving apprenticeships. But um, could you just talk to us a bit about tertiary education and, and wrap up apprenticeships in that um, in, in, in regional Australia and access? Yeah, look, we've, we've put a lot of uh, Minister Cash, just if you want to have a look on the website, go and have a look at what Minister Cash has got there in traineeships, short courses and other as well. Go and have a good look at that and see what's available besides what we're doing through um, the original COVID response around supporting you know, about half of an apprentice's wage up front, then there's additional funding right now ahead to support taking on new people, additional people in your business for people between the ages of, I think it's around between um, 18 and 35. I think that's where it sits um, to get more people, actually new people employed, new people employed as well to help business do that. So, but in the tertiary education space, yes, we put funding into those regional hubs. There's several of them around Australia as well. Um, Dan tian has been doing you know, a lot of work in that space as well. But um, you know, one of the things that's important is that wherever you are in tertiary education, to further refine, or not refine, but enable pathways for people, doesn't matter when they come in or where they want to get to, how just they just need the pathways to do that whether it's um, uh, an apprenticeship a traineeship whether it's going on to um, uh, to um, perhaps to a TAFE or other or whether it's into university I think one of the things that you know collectively is an opportunity is to is to actually uh, and there's work going on I'm, I know that to, to, to offer those opportunities no matter what age or stage you're at or where, at what point you come in and where you want to exit or where you want to get to. And I think the more we're able to make that flexible more broadly, and that I know is, you know, the regional hubs, several universities, part of that hub that provide courses in situ there for people that can't move or, or um, are retraining. And I think we, we're likely to see more retraining ahead as well. And we already know that we're likely to have you know, younger people now are likely to have probably five at least major career changes 
which throughout life means lifetime learning, but also lifetime training and retraining. So in regional Australia, um, that's an important part of what we do and will continue to do as well. And uh, making sure that you know, people of all ages have access to that ongoing, um, I think is just really important to us. But they're very creative people, very innovative people. And uh, we have people who work on mine sites and are retraining with a university and they might only go to that university once to actually do an exam or other. Um, we've got people retraining constantly. Um, and of course, so much now is done online as opposed to face to face. So, you know, th there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, cre creativity and innovation in this space and people taking advantage of all forms that they can to suit them. And so it comes back to what's the market, what do they need to just get on with what it is they want or need to do. Um, I, I really liked what you um, said there, Nola, about flexibility in training and access to training. I think that this is a critical um, area that needs to continue uh, to develop. But um, Segra was down at uh, Port Augusta um, a couple of years ago for its conference and we had a researcher's meeting as as part of that and um a long a long story short the uh one of the outcomes was that people in the room identified that one of the new skills for um the uh, 21st century is um being able to work in sterile environments and uh, that that related to agriculture and uh uh, uh biosecurity um, but also of course in Port Augusta they've got that big hydroponics um, tomato growing uh, factory so working in sterile environments that's that education is not available at Port Augusta or in that region but once the university through that meeting discovered it was a need was able to say well hang on we train nurses as do lots of regions yes universities we ought to be able to run a biosecurity qualification um, so i just thought that that was a really perfect example of a community getting together and sharing what their needs were because the university could provide that but until we had that meeting they didn't know there was even a need for it particularly um, and we need to i hadn't thought that nursing courses could also be um, a sterile environment training. Yeah. And that, that's a great thing, you know, and it goes back to that people who live and work in the regions generally know it best, okay? They actually do. Um, and so if you can get people together and work collaborative, it, it, it's amazing what solutions get found. The one thing about people, particularly in, I was brought up in a really tiny community. And in our community, there were no government services or supports because it was tiny. And if you didn't do it yourself, it didn't happen. And so whatever needed doing, the community got together to make it happen and stayed with it because it was desperately needed. But that buy-in by the local community meant that people realised the need was there and they needed to be the ones not only to make it happen, but to carry it on. And so I think that's in a regional sense, um, that localised knowledge and commitment is what makes our regions and that commitment to each other um, really does make a, a huge difference to me in, in rural and regional and remote areas. And so um, it's that quiet can-do approach. Um, it's knowing there's a problem and being prepared to either work on your own or with others to make it happen and then make sure it keeps happening. And passing on that knowledge and making sure you're bringing through another generation that understands why that's important. So, you know, I think I think in the regions we're, we're very well aware um, of why we do need to work together, which is where SEGRA comes in. And, you know, the, the groups that work in regional Australia, I've got enormous confidence in and I rely on them as eyes and ears. Um, and, uh, but I never lose contact um, with the people. You can understand people are very blunt with me, particularly in my own area or when I'm out and about. When they know I'm a farmer, it's an invitation to be particularly blunt. <laughs> well, the sterile environment one was was very energised the room and made people start thinking about, um, yeah, we don't need whole new courses. We need to use bits of the course. What we've got. What we've got. How do we adapt? Yeah. How do we adapt? How do we modify? How do we fill the gap? And, and I think even when CSIRO spoke to us as MPs, 
and uh, talked about their work that they are doing on a COVID um, vaccine. Again, you talk about that, um, uh, that biosecurity space and the need for sterile, sterile environments. Um, they said that they can only spend four hours at a time in the suits they're required to work in to be able to do the work they do. And so uh, that's an example, for instance, of, of what's needed at this time. But the level of, of um, sterile and uh, protective environment that they work in. So they are incredibly special people doing a huge job for us right around, you know, they do a good job at any time, but right at this moment, you can imagine just the workload for those people and what they're doing for us. Thanks, Nola. We're really drawing on um, the breadth of your experience at the moment. There's yeah. just another little cluster of questions that have come in that are around this issue, um, and it's, it's two-pronged. Uh, but it, one is the issue of attracting people to regional Australia, and you've certainly talked about um, that mm -hmm. COVID's shown that distance working, remote working's possible, but we certainly also know that there are significant shortages, for example, of chefs and electricians yeah. in uh, regional Australia, regional uh, Western New South Wales would be one example that immediately comes to mind. The other one that's more topical uh, and in our faces at the moment is the seasonal workers um, issue of how do we get fruit pickers, etc., into um, regional Australia. And we've got a question here from another Peter. Um, this is a woman. And so um, her question is, how um, can we connect people seeking work with jobs that are available in regional Australia? What are the mechanisms that might be available to do that? So. Yeah. Look, look, there's a number of, you know, there's a number of, um, have a look again on Michaela Cash's website about the initiatives and even some of the websites that are out there. But a lot of my RDAs have got um, connecting um, uh, websites as well to connect people with local jobs, both employers and employees. So have a look at your local RDA site as well. Some local governments and state governments also have got initiatives running as well to connect people with the work that's there. You know, you know we've got a seasonal, we approved um, at a federal level for seasonal workers to come out of the um, Pacific and you've seen the mango uh, pickers come into Northern Territory. They're, even Western Australia is looking at bringing some workers in through that scheme, through, through Darwin and having them um, uh, do their quarantine there. There's some innovative approaches now being considered and thought about about whether people could quarantine on farm even and how that might work. There's a, there's a range of things being considered in this space, but um, a lot of those roles have historically been performed by backpackers and uh, people on um, overseas uh, tourism type visas. And as you know, we, we don't have those numbers of people currently. Um, and in some areas, um, there are some businesses have got labour agreements. In other areas, they're looking, or they have already, designated migration agreements where there's historic and ongoing shortages of workers in specific fields like your chefs and electricians. So there is the skilled list in a normal circumstance. Um, at the moment, those, that is not working in the same way. Um, but if, if we can get um, more people to um, consider looking at where the jobs are and how they can engage with that work that's already there and getting people to, there's incentives out there as well for people um, who have to move or travel in many instances, some are state government um, and some um, are federal. Again, look, have a look on Michaela's site and also Anne Rustin's site as well. Um, have a look at those. But um, this is, I think, um, a great, it's a great challenge for us in rural and regional. There's no question right now that this is a great challenge with the shortages of work uh, of workers in the jobs that actually are there. And um, um, it's something that we certainly hear on a regular basis and we hear it in relation to, you know, picking, packing, planting, harvesting. Um, there's a lot of key um, skills that, and of course, people who can't commission particular bits of equipment that they bought from overseas, where the people who commission it are overseas and aren't coming in at the moment. So there's a broad range of issues around um, 
what's happening in this space that um, we're trying to find every you know innovative way of, of trying to to manage that that we can but there's a there's also um, at a local and state level and through your RDAs keep keep an eye on those as well well look time has run out it's just raced by but look can I just say a, a, on behalf of everyone from uh, the Segra community Thank you so much for your time and your willingness to take on board such a, a wide range of um, uh, questions. And of course, uh, that's part and parcel of regional Australia. So thank you very much. Um, I'll also just like to put in a plug that last week we announced that SEGRA will be held in Kalgoorlie Boulder. So oh, good. Over, yes, over in WA. Uh, from the 16th, 17th and 18th of November. Um, so we hope to stay in touch with you and uh, perhaps see you in Kalgoorlie Boulder as well. Well, hopefully, yes, that uh, depending on the timing. Uh, yes. And hopefully, um, um, time of the year, repeat, tell me what time of the year? November, 16th, 17th and 18th of November. Right, next year. Yes. Right, yeah, because um, we need uh, all the borders open and all of you, the all of your SEGRA members able to come and have a look. And, and if you get a chance and you can see this marvellous um, Bustleton jetty behind me there, if you get a chance while you're travelling in and through, um, come and say good day around the, the southwest as well. But I'm sure, look, can I just encourage you all, oh, a huge thank you, not only for what you do with SEGRA, but as a government, we asked a lot of you, individually and collectively. It was really tough with the lockdown and the decisions we've made as a government have been very, very difficult, very difficult. And we know the impact has, has been felt and we know some of the challenges that have and are arising. But to all of you that have done everything we've asked you to do, um, a huge thank you from us and I know Scott, the Prime Minister, would, would really want me to say thank you because it's, it's with you and through you that we're able to get through this that is a massive challenge, but by you doing all of the right things, but also looking after yourselves and those around you um, has really mattered. And that's what regional Australia, in my view, has done so, so well. So can I just encourage you to keep doing those things and looking after yourselves and your communities and being, you know, the builders the, and the putty and the grease, the putty to uh, fill the gaps, the grease to hold things together and help things run smoothly. Um, that's what we need of all of us that, that live and work in rural, rural, regional and remote Australia. So all strength to your arm. Thank you for joining us today and giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Okay.